passage in the scripture that can heal you, inspire you, encourage you, give you joy that is unspeakable and full of glory, like the story of God's amazing grace. Grace can move mountains of guilt and shame. Grace can calm the troubled sea of the soul. Grace can transform the desert of your days into streams of living water. Grace can take you through the fire of adversity without the smell of smoke coming upon you. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. Say that with me. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. That means you can't earn it by what you do. God gives it to you because he is a God full of grace and truth. Grace is an ocean without a shoreline whose depths have never been plumbed, whose endless healing power have never been realized. It has no boundary, it has no measure, it has no limit. There is not a shoreline that says the grace of God stops here. Grace will set you free from the tyranny of the past. Have you failed? Well, if you haven't, you will, so get ready. Did you make a wrong, wrong choice that stained your life? The grace of God is greater than all of your sin. It's greater than all the mistakes you have made or ever will make. Ask God's forgiveness. Experience his amazing grace. Forgive yourself. Live, love, laugh, and be happy. God is a God of new beginnings, and some of you need to start over again. Give the Lord praise in the house. God has buried your sin in the sea of forgetfulness, Jeremiah says, never to be remembered against you anymore. God said your sin and iniquity, I will remember no more. If God has forgotten it, you forget it. Think about this. You need to stop talking about it. You need to stop thinking about it. I've seen fathers sit by the fireside who call themselves Christians their sons and daughters were sitting at their feet and they were bragging about their ungodly life when they were really sowing their wild oats. And those little ears were absorbing all of that garbage and those little guys are gonna grow up and want to beat everything you ever did. Shut up about your despicable past. If God has forgiven it, you get it out of your mouth and get it out of your home. Now with that lovely thought in mind, let's read Romans chapter one, verse seven. <laughs> read with me. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Every book Paul wrote begins with that salutation. Grace and peace to you through God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the wonderful word of God that is a revelation of God's amazing grace that can heal us and inspire us for all our days to come. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it, and all of God's children said praise the Lord. You may be seated. Grace will set you free from the tyranny of other people. Some of you are prisoners of other people's foolish opinions. They're unreasonable demands, amounts. They're guilt trips that they put you on. Your future is not controlled by your past. Your past ended last night. Your future is today and tomorrow, and nothing can hold you back. For well, the Bible says, if God be for you, say it with me, who can be against you? Regardless of what you have done, you're going to be blamed by somebody sometime for doing something wrong. Every church and most every family, maybe not yours, but most, have what I call grace killers. 
people who go around fault finding. Well, you remember what they did 40 years ago. They really did a bad thing. They can't remember their name and address, but they can remember what you did 40 years ago. It reminds me of the story of the minor league baseball player who was playing his first game in center field, and he made two errors back to back. And the manager, who was overbearing, jumped out of the dugout, grabbed the glove, and said to the center fielder, Shut! Sit down! I'm going to show you how to play center field. He went out to the center field and the first ball was a high fly ball that got lost in the sun. He couldn't see it and the ball fell helplessly to the ground while the runner ran the bases and did an inside the park home run. The second ball came to between the second and first base and was going into right field. The manager raced over to the right field looking at the ball and he hit head on with the right fielder, knocking the right fielder out. This was their best hitter. He's now out of the game. He goes back and takes his position in center field in this classic study of how to play center field. And as he's there, a line drive comes and hits him right between the eyes. Bang! Knocks him out. As they're carrying him off the field on a stretcher, he goes by the dugout and he looks at the young center fielder sitting there. Sitting there. He said, boy, you've got that center field so messed up, nobody can play it. <laughs> Many people are prisoners of other people's opinions. Stop it. Some of you are prisoners of performance trap. You're trying to earn other people's approval by what you do. Give up because the moment you reach their goal, they'll raise it and you'll never be there. St. Paul asked you this question, not me, St. Paul. Galatians 1.10, am I seeking the favor of men or God? Or am I striving to please men? Paul continues, if I'm trying to please men, then I cannot be a servant to Jesus Christ. End of quote. That's a powerful statement. It's a liberating statement. You are either a father pleaser or a people pleaser, but you will seldom be both. Grace will set you free from other people's stupid opinions. Grace will set you free to forgive other people, free to allow other people to be who they are, even when they're different from you. I know some of you haven't grasped that reality yet, but someone else can have an intelligent thought that you don't agree with. A preacher wanted to know what his son was going to be in his future life. So he thought he would give him his own self-made psychology test. He went into the boy's room and he put the Bible on his dresser. If the boy came into the room and picked up the Bible, he'd be a preacher. Beside the Bible, he put a silver dollar. If he picked up the dollar, he'd be a banker. Beside the silver dollar, he put a bottle of whiskey. If he picked up the whiskey, he was going to be a worthless drunk. On the other side of the whiskey, he put a Playboy magazine. If he read that magazine, he was going to be nothing but a womanizer all the days of his life. The preacher got across the hall from his boy's room. He cut a little peek in the door. His boy walked into the room, saw the things on his dresser. He picked up the Bible, put the silver dollar in his pocket, popped the cork on the whiskey bottle, knocked it down a little bit, sat down and started reading the Playboy. And the father across the hall said, Dear God, the boy's going to run for Congress. <laughs> Hello, Washington. Oh, I'll hear about that. 
God's grace is greater than all of your sin. Say that with me. God's grace is greater than all of your sin. And people say, well, I've committed adultery. God's grace is greater than that. I've failed horribly. God's greater than all of your failure. I'm into the occult. The grace of God is greater than Satan's power. God can claim you from the occult. But I've committed murder. So did Moses. So did David. So did St. Paul. They were very significant people. Some of you are in prison right now watching me saying my life is over. When Christ comes into your life, your life is not over. Your life is just beginning. Whatever you have been in the past, the grace of God through his amazing grace can make you a challenging soul winner wherever you happen to be. Grace drove John Newton, who was a slave trader, to write the song Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. John Newton was the man who owned the ships that went to Africa and loaded the Africans and brought them to America where they were made slaves. He saw them beaten to death. He saw them sold like cattle. He buried them at sea. He experienced the most brutal, harsh treatment one human being can give to another. But one day he had an encounter with Jesus Christ and he became a Christian. And he sat down and wrote the words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I assure you, I don't know how far you have fallen from the throne of God's grace, but his arm can reach down and pull you out of the miry clay. He can set you on the solid rock. He'll give you a new name. He'll give you a new character. He'll write your name in the Lamb book of life. You're destined to become a child of God because God's grace is greater than all of your sin. Give him praise in the house of God. Now, all of you Pentecostals and Baptists, listen up. God's grace is greater than legalism. Legalism is defined as this keeping man-made rules to obtain righteousness with God. Some of you went to churches that had 101 ways you could go to hell sitting on your own couch. You didn't really have to do anything wrong. Somewhere, your church leaders got together and said, you have to do these things before you can be considered holy. When I was a child, we were not allowed to play cards, dominoes, monopoly, because they had dice. Dear God, you don't want to raise a gambler in your house. Uh, I don't want to tell you how strict it was because you thought we were insane. I thought we were when I was a kid. Still think that. The point is, those of you who are watching television, if you're being told by your preacher, by an evangelist, or anybody else, the man-made rules to get to heaven, you can forget them. The only thing you have to do to get to heaven is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, confess your sins through the blood of the cross, you're on your way. Paul said, if you can be saved by what you do, Christ died in vain. If you can be saved by what you do, Christ died in vain. You're not saved by church membership. You're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're not healed by crawling down the aisle of a cathedral to kiss a stone image on the toe. You're healed because the stripes on the back of the Lord Jesus paid for your healing before he went to the cross. Only Jesus Christ and his cross can save, heal, and deliver you. Hallelujah for the cross of the Son of God. One of the greatest stories of grace anywhere in the Bible is 2 Samuel, the ninth chapter, speaking of King David's grace toward Mephibosheth. And David said, is there anyone who is left in the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And there was a servant of the house of Saul named Ziba. So when they had called to him, he said, the king said unto him, are you Ziba? He said, yes, at your service. 
Then the king said, Is there still someone in the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness, the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. I want to tell you that story because it is a story of God's amazing grace and it's your portrait in the Word of God. Go back with me in the theater of your mind 3,000 years ago. We are in Israel. Israel is at war. King Saul and Jonathan have just been killed in a bloody combat on the hills of Gilboa. The news of their death reaches the city of Jerusalem. It was a brutal time in history where it was customary that all of the members of the royal family who survived should be killed so that no legitimate heir could come to the throne. When word reached Jerusalem that Saul and Jonathan had been killed, the nurse of Jonathan's infant son, his name was Mephibosheth, that name alone makes you appreciate a name like John or Tom, Harry, simple stuff, Mephibosheth. The nurse was racing out. She dropped him, and he was broken and both crippled in both of his feet. She took him to the land of Lodabar. Mephibosheth is five years of age. We don't hear anything about him for 20 years because he now lives in a place of desolation. That's what Lotibor means. A place of desolation. A place of extreme hardship. Years pass and one day King David is sitting on the throne and he's remembering his dearest friend, Jonathan. And he asks a question that shattered the peace and tranquility of the palace. He says, is there anyone in the house of Saul that I might show him mercy, kindness, the grace of God? It's a majestic statement of God's grace. Is there anyone, not someone who's brilliant, who can serve me? Not someone who's mighty, who can lead an army. But is there anyone? I want, to hear you, I want you to hear this. That's the question the church in America needs to be asking the people in the streets of this nation. Is there anyone? Is there anyone who wishes to come to the cross of Christ? Not someone with the right education or the right amount of wealth or who has the right doctrine or belongs to our denomination or who lives in the right neighborhood or is the right race. We're not saving race here. We're saving human beings who have come to know Jesus Christ. The question needs to be this, is there anyone here whose life has been shattered, whose dreams have been crushed? Is there anyone here who's giving up on your future? Is there anyone here who is down and out, or maybe you're up and out? Is there anyone here who is addicted to alcohol, to drugs? Is there anyone here who's an AIDS victim? Are you poor? Are you sick? Are you hungry? Are you an orphan? Are you a widow? Is there any way we can demonstrate to you the love of Jesus Christ? God's grace will give you a new beginning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Grace will give you a new day and a new beginning. It will bring you back from desolation and place you on the throne where you belong. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. <laughs> 33 generations later, King David's great, great, great grandson, Jesus of Nazareth, asked that question this way, whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever will, let them come. He stands with me today on this platform. You can't see him, but he is here, and the angels of God have surrounded this, ple this piece of sacred soil. And he has his hands extended toward you and those of you that are watching television across this nation, 
across South America, across Europe, in Canada, in China, where 80,000 people a week are being baptized into the underground church. And he's saying, is there anyone, whosoever will, let him come and drink of the waters of life freely. He stands here today and says, are you brokenhearted? Are you lonely? Do you feel forsaken? Have your dreams been shattered? Is your family in crisis? Is your marriage dead or dying? I am the answer. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. Give him praise in the house of God. First outward demonstration of grace is mercy. Get it straight. If you're not merciful, you're not a Christian. Be a church member, but you're not a follower of Christ. The Bible says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Say that with me. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I'm going to say it this way. God has a mercy bank in heaven, and you have an account there. And some of you don't have anything in the account. If you don't put mercy in that account for other people, the day is going to come when you need mercy and God will not extend it to you because you have given it to no one else. That's what that verse says. God is love and they that have not love have not God the Father. Satan could care less how much we sing amazing grace just as long as you sing it with a snarl on your face. Because Christianity without the grace, love, and mercy of God is nothing but another cult. We're a tree without fruit. We are a well without water. We are a cloud without rain. If you have mercy, it will be made manifest. You may have the money of Rockefeller and not show it. A lot of you have. The offering pan's gone by for years and you haven't touched it yet. You may have the musical skill of Beethoven and not reveal it. You may have the knowledge of Albert Einstein and not expose it. But if you have the mercy and love of God in your heart, it will be exposed. You cannot see someone in need and close the bowels of your compassion and walk away from that person and refuse to help them. It's not in your spiritual DNA. Because when you are a follower of Christ, you are like Christ. Do you see the type and the foreshadowing of grace here? Once Mephibosheth enjoyed the fellowship with his father in the palace. Just as Adam and Eve walked and talked with God in the Garden of Eden. Then Satan entered the garden and man was separated from God. Man fell and in the fall, we were crippled in our relationship with God and remain crippled unto the cross. This is a heart beating story of similarity because sin separates man from God. Don't you ever forget that? What is sin? To him that knoweth to do right and doeth it not, to him it is sin. There are people who cover the stench of their sinful lives. Well, well, you know, I've only done this now 101 times, but I'm covered by the grace of God. I don't think so. Grace justifies the sinner. Grace gives you time to repent. Greasy grace justifies the sin. You need to know the difference between the grace of God and greasy grace. Listen to this one sentence. If you forget everything I say today, Get this, granting forgiveness without demanding a change in conduct makes the grace of God an accomplice to evil. I'm going to say it again. Some of you are writing it down. Granting forgiveness without demanding a change in conduct makes the grace of God an accomplice to evil. Think about that. The woman was caught in the act of adultery. They brought her to Jesus. I want to know how those Pharisees caught her in the act of adultery. That's another sermon for another day. Rated X, of course. Jesus said to the woman, recognize now he's the son of God. He's perfect. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And then he said, go and sin no more. Do you hear the change in that? 
Husband to the wife, will you forgive me for adultery? Yes, but I expect you to change. If you have another 11 girlfriends, you'll come home and find your suitcase on the front porch, and I'm going to be singing, hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more. Goodbye. The lights are off and the door is locked. Hello. Sin is a cancer, and you either get the cancer or the cancer gets you. Sin is a crimson stain. It's removed only by the blood of Jesus Christ. Young person, sin is fun for a season. The Bible says that. There's pleasure in sin for a season. It's the blast that doesn't last. It's fun till you get AIDS, and then the laughter stops. It's fun until your hands shake with DTs in the padded cell. You don't know your name. The addiction has destroyed your life and your dreams of tomorrow. Sin is fun until you're flat on your back in an abortion clinic, slaughtering the fruit of your lust. The blood of an innocent child is now on your hands. Sin is fun until your brains are fried with drugs and you don't know what day it is and you couldn't recognize your mother's face. You're a dead man. You are the walking dead. Sin will do that for you. Sin is fun until the nation is overrun with criminals and thieves and rapists and child abusers and drug lords and murderers like America right now. We have thrown the book away and now we are swimming in a moral sewer because we have forgotten the God of the Bible. It's time for the righteous. It is time for the army of God. It's time for those who name the name of Jesus Christ. It's time for we the people who have have a moral fiber left in our being to stand up and speak up and say let God arise and let his enemies be scattered we stand on this word without apology to anyone for any reason Continue in concluding the story. Mephibosheth is hiding in a shack in Lotibor where he's been for 20 years, living on crumbs, wearing rags. A prince who used to live in the palace of the king. He is separated from that palace. And now we hear King David's message. Is there anyone? King's, King David sends a royal chariot to pick up Mephibosheth. Look at that royal chariot thundering up in front of that shack where Mephibosheth has been hiding for 20 years. Afraid of being discovered, certain that he would be killed. The guards go in and get him and bring him out and put him in the chariot and they start racing back toward the city of Jerusalem. And with every turn of the wheels, he's certain he has seen the sunrise for the last time. He's ushered into the presence of King David and he falls flat on his face in fear. And King David, full of grace, looked at him and said, Mephibosheth, fear not. Do you know the words that Jesus used most in his ministry? Fear not. Fear not death. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Fear not disease. I am the Lord that heals all of your diseases. Fear not the past because I've forgotten it and I've forgiven it. Fear not Satan. He's the roaring lion, but I have defeated him at the cross. Fear not wars and rumors of wars. I am the prince of peace. I will destroy your enemies. Fear not your accuser. I will close the mouths of the lions. The Bible says this. I will break the teeth of the wicked out with a rod of iron. I love that verse. I don't know what your tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. Don't live in fear. King Jesus is the Lord of your life. David looked at Mephibosheth and said, I'm going to restore all that you lost at the fall. 
At Calvary, Jesus Christ, my heavenly David, restored all that we lost in the fall in the Garden of Eden. In the fall in the Garden of Eden, we received death. Jesus at the cross gave us eternal life, saying, He that believeth in me shall never die. Say that with me. He that believeth in me shall never die. In the Genesis fall, we lost our health, but on the cross, by his stripes, we were healed. In the fall in Genesis, we lost paradise with God. But with Jesus, he said, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there you may be also. In the fall in Genesis, we lost fellowship with the Father. But Jesus came and said, I will never leave you nor forsake you even to the ends of the earth. In the fall in the book of Genesis, I lost my inheritance. But now Jesus has made us heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And the royal blood of heaven is flowing through our veins. We have been created a little lower than the angels. We are more than a conqueror through Christ. You are the royal ambassadors of the Son of God. Heaven is your home, and it's enough to make a Presbyterian shout for joy. I close with this statement. The text reads, So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, and he ate at the king's table, and now he was lame in both of his feet. 2 Samuel 9, 13. In the theater of your mind, let's go to Dan David's banqueting hall. David is a warrior. He is a poet. He is a songwriter. He is a general. He is a master leader. David took scattered tribes and brought them together and made them the southern and northern kingdoms of Israel. It is called to this day the golden era, and Israel has never matched what they had with King David. It will be matched when Jesus comes. But today it is a sliver of what it used to be. David has said to Mephibosheth, I'm going to restore all that you lost. And you're going to eat at my table continuously. You talk about social security, this is real social security. <laughs> Mephibosheth is sitting at his right hand. We're sitting in a banqueting room. The floor is white marble imported to Israel. The columns are 40 feet high, every 12 feet. Royal blue drapes come from the ceiling and sculptured down and are tagged with gold chains. Guards are standing at either end and a well-trained waitstaff is now beginning to bring the food in as the other guest comes. Now comes Solomon, the heir apparent to the kingdom, brilliant, bright, precocious, knowing that he is the future. There is Absalom, the deceitful traitor who betrayed his father. He has the eyes of a snake and the personality to match scowling, mean-spirited. In the room walks Joab. He is Israel's Rambo. He's the leader of the military forces, muscular, powerful. He is always in the presence of King David. King David then makes the proclamation to everyone there, today I'm restoring Mephibosheth and I'm giving him back all that he has lost. I'm going to give him land of his father. I'm going to give him servants to work the land. They're going to bring him the fruit from all of the harvest and bring it to the palace. He will be here as long as he lives because he has come home. This is his home. And then 
Mephibosheth takes his crippled feet and sticks them under the table. Listen to this. When Mephibosheth puts his feet under the table from his waist up, he looks as wonderful as anyone else. When you as a person come to the table of Jesus Christ, the provision of the cross, and you take your crippled past and put it under the blood of Jesus Christ, it is visible to no one. Not even God looks at it. From his waist up, he is perfect. And when you come to the Lord, suddenly all of the mistakes, the errors, the tragedies of the past are buried, never to be remembered anymore. If Jesus could have this microphone for 30 seconds, this would be his message today. I know that you're not ready to meet me in the clouds of glory, but I want you to come home. I want to restore you. I want to give you a mansion of splendor. I want to give you a dazzling white robe. I want to give you a crown. I want you to have everything back that was lost in the Genesis fall because you belong to me. Think about it. God the Father and his Son are saying, come home. Can you stand to your feet and bow your heads in the presence of the Lord? How many of you in this room can say, Pastor, there is sin in my life. I know that I'm not where I should be with God. And I want today to experience the amazing grace of God. I want to be forgiven of all of my wrongdoing, and I want to come home to the Father. If that describes you, can I see your hand? Would you slip it up now? God bless you. Dozens raising your hand. Dozens raising your hand. Raise them high. Raise them high. Raise them high in the balcony. Let me see. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. As the quartet sings this song, every one of you that have raised your hand, I want you to come forward. I'm going to have a prayer with you. And when we have that prayer, God is going to wipe your slate clean in heaven. And the angels are going to write your name in the Lamb's book of life. And you will have regained all that you lost in the Genesis fall. As they sing, you raised your hand. I want you to come home to the Father. Come now. Come home. Come. Come home. You are weary. Come we'll wait for you from the bow.
There are hundreds of people that have come today to receive Christ. Millions are watching across the nation and around the world. And I ask you to pray this prayer with us in San Antonio today. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I ask you to forgive me of all Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And write my name today write my name in today. the Lamb's Book of Life. In the Lamb's Book of I'm Life. Coming home to the Father. I'm coming home to the Father. I'm regaining what I've lost. I'm regaining what I've lost. As God restores to me, as God restores to me that which has been forsaken. That which has been forsaken. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, from this day forward, from this day forward Jesus, will be the Lord of my life. Jesus will be the Lord of my life. I will read and obey his word and be his disciple. And, be his disciple. and now because of the love of Jesus and the amazing grace of God, I am saved. I am, saved. I am forgiven. I am forgiven. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm on my way to heaven. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Give the Lord a shout of praise in the house of God. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 Will you raise your hand to receive the blessing? May the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And may the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his peace. May you walk in the confidence that all you have lost will be regained. That you are royalty in the kingdom of God. That the royal blood of God the Father now flows in your veins because you have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. By the authority of his name, we pray and say,